Well, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Paige. I'm a contractor at the Learning Garden at the Community Food Bank. Um, and this workshop is Worm Compost at Home. Um, and it will be recorded. So if you would like to access it, um, it'll be available on the Food Bank's YouTube channel. Um, and again, if you need interpretation, um, there are directions in the chat as well as on this visual. Um, so the presentation will be in English um, and so you can select English or Spanish. And I recommend people also click the mute original audio button. Um, that will give you a much clearer sound. Um, so this is our agenda for the workshop. We're gonna start by talking about the importance of diverting food waste. We'll talk about some of the benefits of worm compost. We'll talk about making bins, maintaining your bin, using your worm compost, and we'll go over other resources and do a Q and A. Um, if people have questions as we go, uh, like clarifying questions, feel free to put those in the chat or if you're having any technical difficulties, um, Brandon will be monitoring those um, and can stop me at any point. Um, but first, I kind of just wanted to see um, who's in the room. If folks want to just type into the chat their name if they want to and um, maybe what they're interested in learning today um, from this workshop. Or if you're already worm composting or if you're interested, maybe people can just type in into the chat um, what brought them here. It looks like most people are kind of shy this morning. That's all right. Um, feel free to, to type in there. Oh, here we go. Uh, hey there, excited to learn about worm composting. Interested in getting started in worm composting. Already do regular composting. Awesome, yeah. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the differences between um, kind of your typical outdoor bin and uh, what you would do with a worm bin. Um, Oh, somebody's interested in learning if it's possible to keep worms alive outdoors through the heat of the summer. We'll definitely talk about that. Um, somebody wants to use their kitchen scraps because they have a lot. Awesome, well, thank you all for being here. I think we'll definitely touch on all of these topics. Um, and if we skip anything, we'll just, we'll get to it at the end in the Q and A. All right, so um, to start, um, there is a food waste problem in the United States. Um, about 40% of food that's generated goes to waste. Um, and that's with um, kind of industrial agriculture, which we've moved a lot uh, more towards. We're producing a ton of food, but a lot of it is, is not being eaten, uh, eaten by people. Um, it's also industrial ag, especially when it's done as a monoculture, is um, a pretty extractive um, process. And so we're also um, destroying a lot of our soils across the country. Um, so we're extracting things and then we're producing waste. Um, that waste, the food waste that's not eaten, um, often ends up in landfills where it produces methane gas, which is more potent than CO2. Um, additionally, a lot of those landfills are located, they're disproportionately located in low income and BIPOC, that's Black, Indigenous, and people of color communities. Um, so we're extracting something, creating waste, and then instead of using that waste to compost and kind of rebuild our soils, we're actually, um, it's creating more of a problem by producing methane and also um, being, uh, it's polluting and kind of contributing to social issues. Um, so it's definitely not just an environmental problem. Um, we also need to see food waste as a social problem um, relating to environmental racism and affecting low income and communities of color a lot more than other communities. Um, so some of the solutions to this problem, um, the Institute for Local Self-Reliance put together this hierarchy to reduce food waste and grow community. Um, and so it starts actually, the most preferred method to reduce food waste is by reducing um, the source. Um, so preventing food waste in the first place. 
Um, so that would be like buying less food, um, using food before it will go bad, um, things like that. Um, the second best option is edible food rescue. So things like the food bank, um, taking food that wouldn't be eaten and um, redistributing, redistributing it to people who would eat it or um, to animals and livestock. Um, and what I really like about this uh, hierarchy to reduce food waste versus um, one that the EPA put together, which is a little simpler, is this one breaks down different scales of composting. Um, so we have kind of small scale all the way down to centralized um, large scale composting. And so this, this hierarchy is really encouraging people to instead of looking for looking at big problems and instead of looking at large industrial scale solutions, looking at small decentralized grassroots efforts to, um, to these large environmental and social issues. Um, and so today we're gonna focus on uh, the home composting piece, um, specifically uh, with worms. Um, so I was kind of excited to see that some people are already composting at home outside um, so I wanted to kind of talk a little bit about the differences between um, your typical outdoor hot compost pile and um, how you would go about having a worm bin and doing some worm compost. Um, so your normal outdoor hot compost pile, which we see on the left, um, you know, there's a lot of different ways you can do it, but often people will just build a simple system with pallets. Um, it's an outdoor process. You wouldn't want to have it in your home. Um, and you generally need a pretty large volume of material in order to get that hot thermophilic process. Um, I, for my own home, we don't produce enough um, waste to have a large pile. So about once a year, I actually go and pick up some manure from a local uh, stable and use that to bulk up my, my pile. And that's the, the way that I can get a hot, a hot compost. Um, and it takes about three months to a year to have stable cured compost. Um, and also if you've, if you've worked in uh, Tucson or in the desert, you know that you probably also have to add water to your pile. Um, on the other hand, um, a worm compost bin, um, you can do it inside so you don't need access to outdoor space. Um, instead of just your typical compost, it creates um, high quality worm castings um, which are worm castings is uh, the worm poop essentially it's there it's what they excrete after they eat eat your food scraps um, and worm castings are stable you don't need to cure them um, with typical compost you would need to have it finish the thermophilic or hot process to break down and then let it sit for a while to cure to make sure it's stable um, but with worm castings you don't need to do that um, yeah, and some of the benefits of worm castings, um, they have a high water holding capacity. They have a ton of microorganisms. Um, so especially now with kind of the regenerative agriculture movement, a lot of folks are talking about feeding your soil to feed your plants. Um, and so adding worm compost, you're just adding a ton of bacteria, almost like a probiotic for your soil. Um, it also has humic acids and plant growth hormones, and um, people have seen that it often will increase the rates of germination, growth, um, flower, and crop yields. Um, so on the right, we have um, this photo of an experiment that was done um, at a university, and they added worm they added vermicompost or worm castings or worm compost to different uh, plots of turnips. Um, the far left one, they didn't add any vermicompost. Um, the middle one, they added 10%, and the far right one, they added 20%. Um, just a little note on vocabulary. Um, there's not really good standard language across um, the worm compost industry or community. Um, so you might see worm castings or vermicast, and that's the actual um, excrement from the worms. Or you might see worm compost or vermicompost, um, and that's generally... Um, that same material, but maybe mixed in with a little bit of um, non-processed material. Um, I don't really like vermicompost because I think it it has the word vermi, which people I think associate with vermin. Um, and so I try to just say worm worm castings or worm compost, but you will probably see different, different vocabulary. 
Um, so for doing worm compost at home, often people will do it. Um, the easiest way to get started is in a rubber bin. Um, some people will build a bin out of wood, um, but whatever you have, you're able to use. And essentially what you'll be doing is adding food um, to your bin. The worms will then consume that food as well as the bacteria that's eating the food. And then they will excrete the worm castings that you'll harvest and then use in your garden. Um, there are about over 2,700 different types of earthworms in the world, um, but only about eight or nine of them can be used for worm compost. Um, and we recommend that people use um, Isenia fetida worms, that's the scientific name. Um, they're also called red wigglers, but depending on where you are, um, they can have a lot of different names. So um, if you're gonna buy them from somebody, make sure you ask for Isenia fetida. Um, in other places, they're called red California worms or red wigglers or red composting worms, but Isenia fetida um, is what they're, what they're called. Um, and these worms can eat their body weight in a day. Um, and they, again, they eat the food scraps as well as uh, bacteria and other microorganisms um, that are eating the food scraps and then they excrete the worm castings. Um, they're happiest in temperatures between 60 and 80 degrees. So if, if you're hot or you're cold, they probably are too. Um, they're cold blooded, so they can't regulate their own temperature. Um, they can tolerate between 32 and 95, but below 32, they will freeze and die. And over 95, uh, they'll get too hot. Um, they breathe through their skin, and so they require a moisture of about 60 to 90 percent. Um, probably at home, you're not going to be measuring your moisture content, um, but people use the kind of wrung out sponge method. So if you um, take a handful of your material and squeeze it, you want a few drops of water to come out, um, but not you don't want it to be too soggy, and that'll kind of, that'll kind of show you that you're in the right moisture range. You want a neutral pH, so making sure you're not adding too much citrus um, or things that are going to kind of change the pH um, balance of your bin. Um, and then they also need oxygen, um, so uh, you'll want to you'll need to have holes in your bin so they can breathe. Um, they are sensitive to ammonia and salt, so things like prepared foods that have a lot of salt aren't good. And then um, the main thing that people get in trouble with with ammonia is putting, if you have backyard chickens, um, you wouldn't want to put uh, chicken manure directly into your bin because it has high levels of ammonia and it can hurt your worms or actually kill them. Um, there are a lot of commercial bins available out there. Um, I had some photos of them, but then decided to take them off because they're all between like 100 and $200. Um, so I definitely encourage people to um, make your own bin at home, or um, we also have them for sale on a sliding scale, and I'll talk to that. I'll talk about that later. Uh, but definitely encourage people to use what they have, um, especially to get started. Um, so you can start with a 10-gallon plastic tub. Uh, you want to make sure that it's opaque. Um, worms will hide from light and if they're in the light it will actually paralyze them and they'll um, they'll eventually die if they um, are exposed to light for too long um, and you'll want to drill holes in the top and uh, around around the top and in the lid of the bin with a you can just use a power drill for that um, and that'll make your most simple bin um, as an option some people will put holes in the bottom of the bin um, or and then put a tray below it or they'll stack bins. Um, and if you're going to do that, just know that any liquid that comes out the bottom is leachate. Um, even some of the commercial bins will have a spigot at the bottom for excess water, and some of them will label that as a worm tea. Um, any excess liquid that's coming out is not worm tea, it's a leachate. Um, and if it's sitting for too long, it might have alcohol in it um, and be anaerobic, and it can actually hurt your plants. Um, worm teas and compost teas would be a whole other workshop, but um, that, that is made by taking material, um, putting it in water and actually pumping air through it to have an aerobic process to build up um, some really awesome bacteria um, for, your, for your garden. But uh, the, 
the kind of overflow um, liquid that's going to come out of the bottom if you poke holes is not going to be something that you'd want to use. Um, so once you um, have your bin set up, um, you'll add the bedding. Um, so your, your bin kind of consists of a few things. It has the, the outer container, the bedding, the worms, and then the food that you add to it. Um, and eventually the worms will probably eat the bedding as well, um, but you'll feed them food scraps as you go. Um, so the bedding options that we recommend are shredded black and white newspaper, aged compost or aged horse or cow manure, um, something that if you put it in a pile or in a bin, it's not going to heat up and potentially kill your worms. Um, you can also do peat moss or coconut core um, that might cost a little bit more or uh, leaves or yard waste, um, which is maybe a little difficult here in the desert where we don't have ready access um, to leaves in the fall. But um, if you do have access to that, that makes a great bedding for your worms. Um, when you add the bedding, you also want to make sure that it's moist. Again, kind of that wrung out sponge texture. Um, and in this photo we have, or this drawing, um, it shows somebody spraying it with a spray bottle. Um, and that's a really key piece when you're adding moisture to your bed. You don't want to just dump a cup of water in. Um, you want to make sure you evenly spray liquid so that it kind of evenly uh, moisturizes that area. Um, and you don't end up with any of that leachate or anaerobic kind of smelly, smelly stuff at the bottom. Um, so once you have your bin and it's filled with moist bedding, um, you're ready to add your dirt and add your worms. Um, we recommend adding about a handful of native, native soil. Um, this helps the worms to consume and break down the food. Um, worms don't, can't take a bite out of food. They have a little mouth opening um, where they kind of glob it in and then they, the food passes through their esophagus into a gizzard where they um, crush the food with different um, like small pieces of sand. And so you want to add a little bit of native, native soil so they have some gritty material to help them break down that food. Um, and then you can add um, up to one pound of worms per square foot of surface area. Um, that's a lot of worms and it can get pretty expensive. Um, worms double their population in a month. So we, we our starter kits um, and what we give to people, usually it's less than that, um, especially if it's the first time they've had worms. Um, but if you do want to have a really effective system, uh, you can do up to a pound per square foot. And it's, um, you calculate how many worms you add based on square foot um, because they, they live on the surface, they, they'll bury down a few inches, um, but if you have a really deep bin or a really deep area, um, it won't actually increase um, the habitat of the worms because they, they want to be on the surface kind of spread out. Um, yeah, you also, um, if you're building your own, your own worm bin, that's also a thing to consider is the, the deeper your bin is, um, the more likely the bottom might get a little smelly and anaerobic. Um, and so the bins that we sell are about, um, they're only about a foot deep, just so we, you avoid um, getting too much built up material down there that can get a little smelly. Um, so also when you when you add your worms, um, they'll, they'll take a little while to kind of explore and, and look around. Um, sometimes they'll climb up the sides um, and as long as they're kind of just climbing and not doing much, that's okay, um, when, especially when you first add them. But um, it is kind of a red flag if you've had worms for a bit and they're all trying to get out of the, of the bin, that's a sign that maybe the pH is off or, or something's wrong and making them unhappy. Um, but when you do add them, they will kind of explore and look around and that's normal. Um, so once you have your bedding, a little bit of dirt, and your worms in your bin, um, you're good to go to start feeding them. Um, and you, what you'll want to do is um, cut food scraps, and we'll, the next slide we'll talk about what food scraps are appropriate, but you'll want to cut food scraps into about one inch pieces. Um, this might be a little controversial, there's different schools of thought on this, but I say you don't need to blend the food scraps. Um, if you uh, because worms don't bite the food, they, they do kind of rely on the surface area of the food to, to consume the bacteria and 
um, and the food pieces. And so blending it does increase that surface area. Um, but for me, I found that it sometimes makes the food break down too quickly and attracts uh, pests. Um, I also just don't want to blend food every time I feed my worms. I don't want to get my blender dirty and then have to wash it. Um, so when you're considering if you want to blend your food scraps or not, also just consider what's going to be reasonable for you to maintain over time. Um, and I think adding that extra step of you have to blend it or you have to freeze it, um, any of those things, I think, just make it a bit more of a hassle to maintain. So, so think about what's sustainable and good for you. Um, but if you if you like blending food and it works for you, go for it. Um, just figure out what works best. Um, and you'll want to, so when you once you have your food scraps, you'll pull back some of the bedding like this person's doing with the um, little fork, um, dump the food scraps in, and then cover them with the bedding. Um, and that will allow the worms to get at that food. Um, and it will also help you avoid unwanted pests like fruit flies or just other things. Um, a healthy worm bin should have more than just worms. There might be like some little bugs and different things in there and that's normal and good. Um, but if you do have um, a ton of fruit flies, you can, you can check and see if you're adding too much food and not covering it well. Um, and then you wanna make sure that most of the food is consumed before you add more. Um, a pretty easy mistake initially is to add way too much, way, way too many food scraps. Um, people get excited about diverting stuff from the landfill, about having worm castings, um, and so they put too much food in. Um, so just remember they eat about, about their body weight a day, um, but you want to just, it's, um, if you overfeed them, it's, you're very quickly going to maybe have some problems with pests or smells. Um, and so check that most of the food is consumed before adding more and you, should, you shouldn't have a problem. Um, so here's a little guide that we made about what foods um, worms can eat. Um, so we've got a yes category, a sometimes, and then an avoid section. And um, we give this out when we sell our worm bins. We have a little half sheet um, that you can just stick on your fridge or stick on your um, stick on your uh, worm compost uh, food scrap container, however you're gathering that. But generally worms really like soft, um, soft veggies and fruits like apples, carrots, celery, melon, bananas. Um, they'll also go for crushed eggshells, um, shredded paper, egg cartons and newspaper. Um, you want to avoid paperboard, which is like what uh, cereal boxes are made out of. They won't really go for that. And there's a layer of plastic and ink on it. So that's not something that you probably want to be putting into your, into your bin and having it end up in your garden. Um, you can sometimes feed them bread, rice, potatoes, pasta, garlic, and onion, um, but they probably won't like a ton of it. Um, we, I didn't put um, tomatoes on here, but sometimes tomatoes are a little acidic for them as well. But even at the food bank, we, we fed our worms two different types of tomatoes and some of them they liked it and some they didn't. Um, so it kind of just depends on the acidity as well of, of that food. Um, but just, uh, yeah, make sure you're checking your, your worm bin as you go and kind of learning like what foods they like, what foods you're normally producing. Um, but it is a little more complicated than just throwing stuff into your backyard pile because um, they're kind of picky eaters at, at some points. Um, and you really want to avoid citrus fruit, meat and bones, um, at eggs, pardon. Um, the shells are okay if you crush them. Uh, they also don't like dairy products. And then we mentioned earlier about prepackaged foods that are salty or spicy or greasy or fatty. Um, they won't really have a good time with, um, and then pet waste as well. Um, so those are foods that they, they might just not eat them, but it also might bring bacteria and bring um, other pests into your bin, um, or it can harm your worms. So definitely avoid those. Um, and again, make sure that your worms have consumed all or most of the food before you add more to avoid odors and pests. Um, are there any questions up until this point? Um, I guess feel free to put them in the chat. I'm gonna take a sip of water. 
Grace, am I good on speed or do you want me to take more breaks? How are you doing? Okay, great. Okay. Um, so once you have your bin, you've got your um, your bin is made, you've got your bedding, your worms, a little bit of dirt, and you've started feeding them. Um, at that point, it's a good time to start really monitoring your, your bin. Um, so opening it up, looking in it, taking a whiff, um, kind of digging around a little bit. Um, this photo on the right shows um, the end of a little worm and then that yellow um, yellowish brown thing is a worm cocoon. Um, so I mentioned that worms can double their population in about a month. Um, they will um, lay these cocoons that will hatch about one to five little tiny baby worms that will then grow. And so if you see a bunch of cocoons in your bin or a bunch of really small tiny baby worms, um, that's a sign that the worms are really happy and that they're reproducing. Um, so the bin should smell earthy. Um, you want the contents to be the moisture of a wrung out sponge. Um, and then if you, if you dig around, you should be able to see um, worms in the bedding as well as cocoons if it's happy. Um, if you do have problems in your bin, um, these are kind of some ways to solve them. And um, all of this information is we're recording this, so it'll be available on YouTube, but a lot of it is also available in a little um, booklet that I'll, um, I'll show at the end that we also give away with, with our worm bins that just has a really good troubleshooting guide. Um, but if you um, add too much liquid to your bin and it's too wet, like you have water pooling at the bottom or liquid coming out, um, you can just add more dry bedding. Um, if it's too too dry, um, you'll wanna take your spray bottle and spray spray water in your worm bin. Again, don't dump water directly in cause that'll just kind of concentrate it in different spots and you wanna try to give it an even um, amount of moisture. Um, if your bin starts to smell, um, it might be too wet or you might, um, you might not be burying your food scraps well or you might be overfeeding them. And so make sure the scraps are buried and maybe try feeding them a little bit less. Um, if you get a lot of fruit flies, um, often the fruit flies will just stay in the worm bin. They'll stay where the food is, but if they do become bothersome and an issue, you can make a simple uh, fruit fly trap, which you, you can see here is just a um, like a soda or a water bottle that you cut the top off of and then invert it um, and then add a little bit of vinegar with, um, with dish soap in the bottom, like a little drop of dish soap to break the surface tension. Um, and that will that will just trap fruit flies in there and hopefully take care of that problem. Um, also, if you have other things that come up, um, I put our email here and we'll, we'll have it up again, but feel free to reach out to us and we can try to help troubleshoot. Um, there are a lot of resources online. There's some good Facebook groups and um, different YouTube videos as well that have troubleshooting. So if you just um, type into Google, whatever issue you're having, probably somebody else has had that problem too. Um, and you can kind of try to diagnose it and figure out what you need to do uh, to keep your bin happy. Um, so somebody in the chat mentioned that they were um, interested in knowing about keeping their worms alive in the summer um, and having them outside. Um, so I also have had folks reach out that wanted to get composting worms and add them directly to their, um, to their garden. Um, when you harvest your worm castings, you probably will harvest some cocoons and maybe some worms and you'll kind of accidentally add those to your garden. Um, and depending on how your soil is and how well irrigated it is, it's possible that they could survive. Um, but worms, they do need a temperature. Um, they're most happy in 60 to 80 and from May to October in Tucson at least, uh, the average high temperature is over 90. Um, so we recommend if you just have your small 10 gallon bin, um, it probably needs to go inside for the summer. Um, otherwise they're just gonna get too hot and die. Uh, however, if that's not possible, if you have a larger bin um, and you want it to be outside, um, we definitely recommend checking on it a lot more than you normally would. Um, you'll likely wanna spray it with more water to keep that temperature down. 
Um, and really the bigger of a bin you have, the easier it's gonna be to maintain that, um, that inside temperature. It, it won't fluctuate as much with the air temperature if you have a lot of material. Um, but for a small bin, um, it's gonna be pretty challenging to keep it cool outside. Um, but you can, you can um, there are things you can do to, to make that work. Um, you could also keep it in the shade or bury it in the ground. So some people will dig like a small hole and just sink, put the, put the bin in there um, in a shady spot in your backyard. Um, and that will help, the, the ground will just help insulate it and keep it cool. Um, you can also add frozen water bottles or ollas. Um, there's a picture of an olla on the right here. It's basically just a clay pot that you can fill with water um, and put in your bin. Uh, this probably would be too big for a 10 gallon bin, but if you had a larger one, you could do it. And what, what it basically does is you fill it with water and that'll, it'll stay a little cooler and it'll also just slowly um, release water. And so the worms might kind of move towards it as a cooler, um, moister spot. Um, but those are, those are some, um, some ways you can try to keep your worms cool. But again, um, if you're not gonna be checking it every day, um, they probably just need to come inside. Um, so now that you've got your worm bin, you're feeding it, you're taking care of it in the summer, um, eventually you will be ready to harvest your worm castings. Um, so there's a couple of different ways to do it. We've talked a little bit about um, what, how worms behave. They, you know, they like to live on the top of the soil, they move, they will tend to go towards food and moisture, um, and they avoid light. And so the different ways that you can harvest your worm castings kind of utilize um, those, those uh, facts about worms. Um, so there's an easy way and then there's a fast way. Um, the easy way is to move all of the contents of your worm bin to one side and then on the empty side, add fresh bedding and moisten that new area and then start feeding the worms on the new side in the fresh bedding. And eventually in about a month or so, um, the worms will chase the food and they'll, they'll head over to that new side that's moist um, and they'll set up shop over there and they'll leave um, fresh castings behind. Um, keep in mind that cocoons will take a few weeks to hatch. So it's possible that you'll have, when you, when you do this, you might have some brand new cocoons and they might, uh, they might have just ha hatched. And so if you um, wait a little bit longer, it's more likely that more of them will, will have left, but likely whenever you harvest again, you're gonna, you're gonna end up with some cocoons and, and baby worms in the finished material that you're using. Um, the other way to harvest your worm castings is called the fast way. Um, so again, worms will chase food, but they run from light. And so this method is using the running from light side of their behavior. Um, and so what you want to do is empty all of the contents of your worm bin onto a tarp and put them into small piles um, under a light. Or if it's not too hot outside, you can also do this outside. Um, and within an hour, so not a month process, just an hour, um, they will move to the bottom and center of the pile. And then you can harvest um, the material on the top. And then at the bottom, you'll have um, a bunch of worms um, that have kind of fled the, the hot, dry sun uh, or bright light. And you can just add those worms back to your bin. Um, this one, you're more likely to end up with a lot of cocoons in your finished material. Um, because you're not giving that amount of time that, that they would need to hatch and then to, to move away from, um, from the material that you're harvesting. Um, so those are the two ways you could harvest your worm castings. Um, again, the fast and slow, and uh, both of these are also laid out in the little booklet that we, that we give folks that we'll also drop the link at the end for. Um, so once you have your finished worm castings, um, it's time to use them, which is an exciting, exciting piece. Um, and again, worm castings are really, they have a lot of bacteria um, and good microbes and humic acid. They're just really a really great natural fertilizer for your plants. Um, and you can add them uh, to the top of your house plants, like just about a tablespoon or a little more per plant, depending on the size. Um, you could also mix it in with your compost compost or potting soil when you're preparing your garden. Um, and between 10 to 20% is plenty. Um, you don't need to overdo it. Um, 
You can also use it as a top dressing. So if you already have your, your beds planted, you can just kind of put it um, on top of your plants and eventually that'll kind of, um, with watering, it'll, um, it'll pull those nutrients down into your soil. Um, you can also put it in your seed rows or at the base of transplants. So if you um, are transplanting, you'll want to dig a hole in your garden and then you can uh, put uh, worm castings at the base of that plant or at the base of the hole and then plant the seedling on top of it. And that'll, um, that'll help the roots get in there and, and soak up some of those nutrients and incorporate them into the soil. Um, so that's kind of the kind of A to Z um, step, basic steps of how to start a worm bin and, and how to use, um, use the material and a little bit of troubleshooting. Um, there's definitely a lot more that can be said about worm anatomy and different types of worms and um, details of what you're feeding them, but that's kind of the, the simplified version for um, somebody just kind of getting into worm composting. Um, at the Nuestra Tierra Learning Garden at the Community Food Bank, um, we have worms, worm castings, and starter worm bins for sale. Um, I'll have uh, Brandon go ahead and drop the price and supply list into the chat. Um, we're trying to move towards a more sliding scale um, type of system to make sure that things are accessible. Um, so these are our prices for right now, but they might, they might change a little bit. Um, but we, yeah, these are, this is what we're offering, but um, we're doing a starter kit bin um, that includes a 10 gallon plastic tub. Um, it also has bedding in it and it has about a quarter pound or 200 worms. Um, and then we also will give you the how to guide. Um, and um, if you're if you're doing that, if you're just doing composting at home, um, that's something you can do. Um, if you are with a school or a community garden or a nonprofit, um, we also have a larger system set up at the at the learning garden that you can see on the left. Um, we built a um, a big shade structure with an adobe wall, um, and we just have we have way bigger systems there that we're happy to give tours of and show people how to use them if you're um, trying to do uh, worm composting on a larger scale. Um, so Brandon just dropped that information into the chat. Um, oh, he also put in, um, so I mentioned if you, um, if you didn't catch the whole workshop or you're hopping on late, um, we will post a recording of this on the Food Bank's YouTube channel. Um, and I, I touched really briefly on regenerative agriculture and healthy soils, but uh, there was a couple of weeks ago, um, Brandon gave a really great building healthy soils workshop that is recorded and the link is there as well. Um, so feel free to access that. Um, and if you'd like to buy um, castings, worms, or starter kits, um, reach out to us at garden at communityfoodbank.org. Um, and again, if you're part of a larger um, institution and want to start a composting system at a school or anywhere, um, we would love to get in touch and show you our system and, and how it works. Um, we also, one thing I really like about our system, um, we there's food scraps that are generated from the food bank, but most of them actually go to um, a pig farmer or a couple of different pig farmers, um, kind of that higher up level of feeding livestock over, feed, over making compost with it. Um, and so a lot of what we get is um, yard waste and um, things from the actual garden as well as manure from our chickens. And then we also um, get uh, coffee grounds from Starbucks. And we don't feed those things directly into the, into the worm bins, especially the chicken manure. Um, we actually pre-compost all of it. So we, we have a bunch of hot thermophilic piles that we build. Um, and what we're doing with that is really um, getting a much higher bacteria and microbe load into the compost. And so um, or into the feedstock. And so we're feeding the worms the food scraps, but we're also basically breeding a bunch of bacteria and microbes that the worms also love. Um, and we were just out there today and uh, they're, they're doing really well. So if you, if you need worms, please reach out because we have a lot of worms right now and we'd be happy to, um, to get you started. Um, and again, if you, if you have issues or anything come up uh, please reach out because we also would love feedback of kind of what's working, what could be better. 
um, so that we can support more people who want to do backyard composting and worm compost. Okay, um, finally, here are some more resources. Um, so here on the left is the indoor composting with a worm bin um, that was actually put together by the New York City Compost Project and they, they've translated it into about 10 to 15 different languages. Um, and so that's just what we give to people when they buy a starter bin. And then um, we have a little insert that has um, the food guide of what to feed your worms that you can stick on your fridge. And then it also has some um, suggestions of how to keep your worms cool and just some, some uh, thoughts for the summer um, and specific things about doing worm compost in the Sonoran Desert or in a hot, arid climate. Um, there are also two books here. Uh, worms Eat My Garbage is maybe one of the most, no most well-known books, um, but it's a, it's a really helpful, um, helpful guide for um, an at-home worm composter. Um, it just kind of walks you through um, setting things up, talks about different types of um, earthworms, and um, it's just a very in-depth guide. Um, there's also the Worm Farmer's Handbook on the right by Rhonda Sherman. And that book is really going to be helpful if you're more part of an institution that's looking for a mid to large scale uh, worm compost or vermicompost system. Uh, Rhonda Sherman also has um, a lot of really great webinars and free workshops that are available on YouTube, um, but I highly recommend her information because it's just all um, really accessible and really easy to, to navigate and just really high quality information. Um, I also mentioned, so the food bank has um, worms and worm bins available. Um, and we, we do sales on uh, Wednesday and Saturday mornings. Um, currently, because of COVID, it's by appointment only. Um, but there are also two really great businesses here in Southern Arizona that are also that also offer um, worms and castings. And that's Inch by Inch here in Tucson, as, where, as well as Arizona Worm Farm up in Phoenix. Um, so if you're looking to get, we're, we're trying to get a lot of people to have um, worm composting systems. So um, if you're trying to order like a really massive amount of worms or a really massive amount of castings, we probably aren't able to accommodate that. Um, but Inch by Inch or Arizona Worm Farm might be able to. Um, I also mentioned worm teas before and um, both of them have worm teas available on certain days of the week. Um, they're both on um, Instagram and social media and have websites. So if you're looking to get um, a, lot of, a lot of materials, um, reach out to them and they should be able to help you. Um, so that's, that's all I have for today. Um, I did want to do a quick shout out before we jump into questions and answers. Um, this is part of the Food Bank Spring Workshop Series that are, that are all virtual because of uh, the pandemic, but the, um, the next one is going to be in two weeks on, uh, or more than two weeks. Uh, the next one will be on June 5th at 10 a.m. Um, and it's going to be an introduction to building with natural materials. Um, and maybe if Brandon, you want to drop the link um, for registration in there. But if anybody is not registered but interested in that workshop, um, feel free to add your information um, to get the link. And I believe that one will be recorded as well. But um, but yeah, and, and check out uh, the Garden Workshop website every once in a while because we'll be doing uh, fall workshops as well. And you can just check back there for information. Um, but yeah, let's go ahead and um, are there any questions from folks? And yeah, it looks like Brandon just dropped that link um, for the Garden Workshops into the chat. So you can you can click on that. Uh, what are the dimensions of your worm bins? Um, so our bins are, they're just a little 10 gallon tub. Um, they look a lot like this one. Um, the actual dimensions are probably, 
like two feet by a foot and a half and they're about a foot deep. Um, they're not super big, but um, yeah, I can, I can look that up and, and send that as well. Um, but they're, it's a 10 gallon capacity. Um, it's very much a, just a starter bin. Um, if, you, if you've been doing worm composting, um, you might want a bigger one, but uh, this one was just what we thought would be most accessible for people and wouldn't take up too much space in their home. But if you, if you wanna build your own or have a bigger one, you can also just pick up worms from us or from Inch by Inch or the worm farm up in Phoenix. Um, however, whatever is best for you. Okay, so you see, you mentioned worms can eat about their body weight in a day. In this kind of worm bin, do you have an approximate amount of food you think you might add a day? Um, Okay, sorry, we lost interpretation for a second. Are we all good? All right, so for, um, for that size of worm bin, again, it's gonna be um, the amount of food that you feed it is gonna be based on how many worms you start with. Um, so we give people about 200 worms um, or a quarter pound um, and so you could probably put in about a quarter pound every day, um, but I, it would really, it kind of depends on what, um, what type of food you're putting in. So it's, it's a little tricky because it's, um, it's going to be by weight um, and that'll also kind of play in with moisture. Um, I would probably put in, maybe start with half a cup a day or less um, and then work your way up. Um, because it's going to be a little better if your worms are kind of hungry, they'll they'll just start to eat the bedding a little faster. Um, versus if you add too much food, um, they'll it'll get smelly and you'll probably have other pests. Um, but definitely just start small and monitor your bin and check on it. Um, and you you might not be adding food every day. You might just be adding it every three or four days or even once a week. Um, but it definitely, it's hard to say, give an exact recommendation, because I think uh, depending on the temperature and um, a lot of different factors, your earworms will reproduce at a different rate. Um, and so within a month or two, you might be able to feed them more. But again, it's just the biggest thing is just to monitor your bin and check on it. Yeah, it's, it's definitely, I think, um, with composting and worm compost, um, every you know we, we kind of all want the the easiest answer but i think in most scenarios it just really depends on a lot of other factors um, but that's what you would consider Oh yeah, so Brandon just said the specific container that our starter bins are is the Rubbermaid Roughneck. It's a 10 gallon container. And then we put, um, we put holes on the top and the lid and on the sides. Um, and we, we just are giving out one bin. Um, some people, if you want to add holes to the bottom, you can. Um, again, you'll wanna put a tray below likely. And then, um, a lot of commercial systems or even DIY systems will have layered bins. And so you'll have holes in the bottom of your bin and you'll fill one with castings and you'll put another bin on top with fresh bedding and the worms will slowly move up through those holes into your next bin. And so you can kind of create a flow through system. Um, we, we just kept it to one bin just to keep the price down and keep it as accessible as possible when people are getting started. Um, but there's definitely a whole world online of um, doing multiple bins as well as flow through systems. Um, some of the systems you add material to the top and you harvest out the bottom. Um, there's things called like a worm bag that do that, but they're, um, they're more a price point of about $300. Um, and so I definitely encourage people to 
before you go big and buy a ton of worms and put a bunch of money into a system, uh, make sure that it's for you, make sure you have fun with it um, and that it's something that you're able to maintain. Um, but that's kind of why we just went with the, the simple one bin version for, for our starter kit, just to keep it, keep the cost low and um, have it be as accessible as possible. But you definitely can uh, buy those bins on your own and, um, and add them in layers if you want to. And there's, there's a lot of tutorials online of how to do that. And feel free to get in touch if you want uh, recommendations on some good YouTube videos or guides. We'll give another minute or two just to see if there's any other lingering questions. And I'll, I'll flip back to the, the um, more resources page just so people can see those, those books. Um, other than the New York City Compost Project, are there any other resources available in Spanish? Um, so I have looked around online and I found some. Um, there, there's a couple big worm composters around Mexico that um, I've gone, actually went to a talk from one of them a couple of years ago. Uh, but I, yeah, I don't have any handy, but I think we definitely can find more and share those. Um, and I'm not sure if Worms Eat My Garbage has been translated into Spanish. Um, I don't think Worm Farmer's Handbook does, but Brandon, do you know if Worms Eat My Garbage is available in Spanish? I do not know, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, Definitely as the, as the garden team too, um, I speak Spanish and my coworker also does. So if, if folks wanna come in person um, with an appointment um, and with a mask for the pandemic, um, we're also happy to, to coach people and, and show people our system and, and can do that in English or Spanish. So um, yeah, we, as the food bank, we wanna encourage people to, um, to be able to do this. And so if, if uh, language is a barrier, please reach out and we can we can support. All right. Oh, oh, somebody says this is help, very helpful and inspiring. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Um, yeah, it's having worms is a lot of fun. So I'm excited for, for more people to get involved. All right, well, I think we will go ahead and wrap it up then. And um, if you have any questions, feel free to email us. Um, if you'd like to order a worm bin, feel free to email us. Um, and this recording should be available on YouTube in the next few weeks. Um, and I'm happy to also, um, if people want just the direct slides, I'm happy to share that as well. Um, or if you if you don't want to get a worm bin from us, but you want like that half sheet that we made with the food guide, we can also share that. Um, whatever whatever resources people want access to, we're we're very happy to share. All right. I hope everybody has a good day. Thank you.